Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of World Panorama. Here we are getting you your weekly dose of major international news with a perspective. I am Sana Khan. Before we get you detailed reports, here's a look at the top stories this week. The world is outraged by the US snooping scandal. In its defense, NSA director says America's spy programs disrupted dozens of attacks. Early election results in Iran are out. Moderate cleric Hassan Rouhani seen heading towards outright victory. Turkey protests enter a crucial phase. Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan makes conciliatory move to end protests. And Usain Bolt strikes back, wins the Diamond League in Oslo with a world-leading time of 19.79 seconds in 2,200 meters. Right, straight to the story in focus this week. A fierce debate about internet privacy and the limits of U.S. executive power erupted on Tuesday in a victory for the young intelligence technician at the center of a global leak storm. While 29-year-old Edward Snowden has gone to ground in Hong Kong and many yet face legal action for blowing the lid on Washington's vast internet snooping program, he has triggered the public battle he said he wanted. Snowden's leaks to the Guardian and Washington Post newspapers published last week revealed PRISM, a top secret program of the U.S. National Security Agency to collect and analyze data from internet users around the world. U.S. intelligence chiefs insist the sweep has saved American lives by helping agents thwart terror plots and authorities have in fact opened an investigation that could see the contractor extradited from Hong Kong to face charges. But many inside and outside the United States were outraged by the breadth and secrecy of this operation which was carried out under the broad brush terms of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act or FISA and the Patriot Act. The U.S. is embarrassed, defending itself, even facing a backlash from a host of countries over its spy program. A larger debate of secrecy versus privacy has surfaced. This is what we are discussing this week. Captain Alok Bansal, Executive Director at South Asian Studies for Strategic Affairs, joins me this week on the show. Before I get your perspective, sir, I've compiled this report for our viewers. Let's have a look. I gave an approximate number to them in a, okay, classified, okay. in a classified, but it's dozens of um, terrorist events that these have helped uh, prevent. Okay, From so my dozens. Both here and abroad in okay. disrupting or contributing to the disruption. This was the NSA's first public testimony since the revelations of the surveillance programs a few days ago. The issue sparking off a debate inside America and outside. The highest priority of the intelligence community is to understand and to combat threats to our national security. But we do so in full compliance with the law. We recognize that the American public expects the FBI and our intelligence community partners to protect privacy interests, even as we must, even as we must conduct, conduct our national security mission. Washington further declined to comment on its surveillance program on China and Hong Kong by randomly referring the program to anti-terrorism efforts. individual who's under investigation uh, in the matter of unauthorized leaks of classified information uh, is not a subject that I can discuss because of that investigation. The leaks themselves were very serious and they go right to the heart of our efforts to combat terrorism, to combat efforts by extremists who desire to attack the United States and the American people. Snowden, a former NSA contractor, has acknowledged that he was the source of reports last week in Britain's Guardian newspaper and the Washington Post about the agencies monitoring of phone and internet data at big companies such as Google Inc. and Facebook Inc. Snowden told the Guardian he could not allow the US government to destroy privacy, internet freedom and basic liberties for people around the world with this massive surveillance machine they're secretly building. Under PRISM, according to the leaked documents, the NSA can issue directives to internet firms to gain access to private emails, online chats, pictures, files, videos and more uploaded by foreign users. All right, Captain Bunsell, you know, in the U.S. and elsewhere, liberals are reacting with, you know, shock and outrage at the U.S. government, the same government that has talked about, uh, you know, internet freedom and privacy rights. How do you see this, uh, you know, people are calling it the snoop gate. How do you react to that? 
See, this is a very serious issue actually. It's a issue which pits individual freedom against national security. It's in gross violation of US Fourth Amendment which uh, enshrines certain individual freedoms for an individual. Uh, the manner in which the US government has gone about doing mm. this snooping is actually a very, very ironical if you see in the aftermath of 9-11 when there was actually a huge reaction against the terror attacks. I think the President Bush has steamrolled certain mm. proposals and not everybody has been kept on board. Only four members of the Congress was briefed about this snooping that was going on. Yeah. Only one out of the 11 FISA judges actually knew about it. Mm. And the fact is that it's been going indiscriminately. In fact, now the latest reports that are coming says that virtually metadata as far as every single call made in the United mm. States uh, has been held with the NSA. And metadata includes who has made a call, what is the length of the call, yeah. and uh, What's the content. The, the, the con the Content, it claims that it is mm. not known, but this is again, as far as the United States is concerned, mm. as far as the external data is concerned, even that is not. As far as PRISM is concerned, how, what does it do? It's not totally known. It actually trolls the data yeah. from uh, these social sites like Google, Facebook, mm. etc. And that is where I think the countries outside US yeah. are seriously concerned because whether we are in India, Hong Kong, you or Europe, mm -hmm. everybody's data invariably is kept in servers within United States. And that actually allows United States access to many of these informations. Yeah. And now to say, because see, what has happened is because of ever since this report has come public, mm. the bipartisan, uh, both the parties, that is Republican and Democrats, yeah. there has been split. Mm. Uh, uh, there are some who say that national security and it has prevented so many attacks, so it's I think yes. a worthwhile Defending thing. Defending it. But again, the problem mm. is even if it may be desirable, the data remains forever and its yeah. misuse in future cannot be prevented. Mm. See, once you have compile the data of an yeah. individual that data but then let me also ask you you know surveillance practices like these are uh, you know only this has come to light right now but in fact they are common and people know that they're common and in fact even legal in some countries uh, like china so then one can ask that what is the fuss really all about if this practice is legal and if it you know actually aids in something then what's the fuss see the point is it if you have a suspicion against a particular individual and if you discriminate and uh, snoop on a particular individual or particular suspects, hmm. it's okay. But as it appears, right now it looks a question, case of indiscriminate Indiscrim snooping. Uh, you are snooping everybody's calls, you yeah. are looking into everybody's social... See, every individual in this hmm. earth has something to hide. Yeah. It may not be secrets or it may not be a terror attack. I may be passing some comment about hmm. you, some opinion about somebody else, something, I'm visiting certain sites. I do not want. And if that was not the case, yeah. every individual would not have a password hmm. for an internet account. Yeah. If everything could be public, <laughs> why, why do we need a password? So the fact is, every individual has a corner which it doesn't want to share yeah. with everybody else. Now, that is where the problem is. See, hmm. I have no problems if you can actually prevent uh, terror attacks by snooping. But the point is... It should be directed in, you know... Absolutely. Directed and the, in one particular possibility not just that this data can be misused in future mm. yeah. because this data will remain forever. They have got servers where they have kept this data and this data will remain so, forever. So, but having said that, Pakistan being the second most snooped country, India being the fifth most snooped country, it is at some level going to then impact relationships of the US with, the, uh, you know, other countries at this level? See, unfortunately, I think uh, most of the Asian countries have not really reacted in the manner hmm. many of the European countries have yeah. reacted. Uh, I think the European laws on privacy are far more strident. And uh, as a result, you have seen Germany hmm. and some of the European countries take very, okay. very uh, active steps. Uh, I haven't really seen in Pakistani media too hmm. much of uh, halla about yeah. uh, this issue, which is a very, very significant issue. Pakistan, Afghanistan, of course, uh, being the nerve center of hmm. global terror in today day I, it makes sense for mm. us to be uh, trolling data from that okay. but a country like india which they mm. call it uh, as an emerging ally yeah. or a country with which they have long-term mm. strategic convergence of interest mm. these are issues i think even in, in india 
uh, neither the media nor the government has taken this issue very, very seriously. Yeah. Because this is a serious infringement because there are a lot of official communications in today's world. So which perhaps are uh, this is a wait and watch policy that some of the countries are adopting at this point in time. Just too early uh, because Snowden, uh, the man himself, the whistleblower, he promises many more leaks and who knows uh, you know, what all the US government has in store with them in terms of information. Thank you so much, Captain Bansal, for joining me and helping us understand uh, the Snoopgate uh, uh, saga that's playing out these days in the media. Thanks once again. All right, let's move on. Initial results showed on Saturday that moderate Iranian cleric Hassan Rouhani looked to be heading toward an outright victory over his conservative rivals in the presidential election. More than 50.5 million Iranians were eligible to vote to find a successor to President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and Iranian authorities and media reported massive numbers of people did turn out for Friday's vote. Iran's reformist-backed presidential candidate surged to a wide lead in early vote counting on Saturday, suggesting a flurry of late support could have swayed a race that once appeared solidly in the hands of Tehran's ruling clerics. 401,949 votes for Mr. Rouhani, 126,899 for Mr. Khalibov, 119,294 for Mr. Jalili, 109,082 uh, votes and 59,000 for Mr. Valenti, and 13,431 votes for Mr. Karazi. But the strong margin for former nuclear negotiator, Hassan Rouhani, was not yet enough to give him an outright victory and avoid a two-person runoff on next Friday. Millions of Iranians voted to choose a new president on Friday, urged by Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei to turn out in force to discredit suggestions by ARC4, the United States, that the election would be unfair. The vote bringing an end to the eight-year era of the combative president Mohammad Ahmadinejad has taken unexpected turns in the past days as reform-minded Iranians surged behind the lone moderate left on the six-candidate ballot. With the conservative camp divided, reformers seem confident of a good showing by moderate cleric Hassan Rouhani, who has emerged as a fortuner with a real chance of forcing a runoff. Analysts say a pack of three heads, the conservatives, former foreign minister Ali Akbar Vilayati, Tehran mayor Mohammad Bakr Kalabaf, and the Islamic Republic's chief nuclear negotiator Saeed Jalili. Under the election rules, a candidate has to win more than 50% of the total vote cast to win outright. A first-round winner gaining less than that must compete with the runner-up in a second round a week later. To placate the protesting activists, Turkish government has offered to hold a referendum over redevelopment plans of Gezi Park. The discussion was the first sign that Erdogan was looking for an exit from the showdown and came hours after some European leaders expressed concern about strong-arm Turkish police tactics and hopes that the Prime Minister would soften his stance. Turkey's government on Wednesday offered a first concrete gesture aimed at ending nearly two weeks of street protests proposing a referendum on a development project in Istanbul. The outcome of this meeting is that uh, we can consider holding a referendum uh, for the residents of Istanbul. I'm not talking about a nationwide referendum, but we will ask Istanbul residents, do you want this project or not? Word of such a referendum came after Erdogan hosted talks with a small group of activists. Many civil society groups behind the protest boycotted those talks in capital Ankara, saying they weren't invited. But despite the offer, protesters continued to converge on Taksim Square, the epicenter of repeated clashes between riot police firing tear gas, water cannons and rubber bullets. An early sign that the proposal hadn't diffused the demonstrators' concerns. We hope that Gezi Park would become an example by this means. 
We believe that our responsibility as citizens come to an end after this meeting and we call on the government and authorities for a common sense. But we told the government that we have no authority to comment on the proposals to resolve the conflict. What began more than a week ago as a campaign against government plans to build over the park has spiraled into an unprecedented display of public anger over the perceived authoritarianism of Erdogan and his Islamist-rooted AK party, leading to the worst riots in decades. Very clear in the statements, and I repeat again, excessive use of force by members of the police against peaceful demonstrators must be swiftly and thoroughly investigated and those responsible held accountable. Protests erupted on the 31st of May after a violent police crackdown on a peaceful sit-in by activists objecting to a development project that would replace Gezi Park with a replica Ottoman era barracks. Erdogan, who has claimed the protests were orchestrated by extremists and terrorists, has become the centerpiece of the protesters' ire. So a referendum, then, would be a political gamble that the government can mobilize its supporters, win the vote and the demonstrators would go home. With that time for a short break, lots more coming up in just a minute. Join me for the latest from the Syrian conflict on the other side as the humanitarian crisis there worsens. You're watching World Panorama. Nearly 93,000 people have been confirmed killed since Syria's civil war began more than two years ago. The United Nations said on Thursday a sharp rise in the death toll as the fighting turns increasingly sectarian and the carnage gripping the country appears to be unstoppable. The grim benchmark came as President Bashar al-Assad's regime has scored series of battlefield successes against the rebels seeking his ouster and international efforts to forge a round of peace talks have stalled. Syrian rebels battled regime forces on Thursday for control of a key military base in central Hama province after chasing soldiers out and setting fire to installations. The fighting came as the United Nations released figures that highlighted the carnage that has engulfed Syria for more than two years saying that almost 93,000 people have been confirmed killed in the conflict. The constant flow of killings continues at shockingly high levels, with more than 5,000 killings documented every month since last July, including a total of just under 27,000 new killings since December 2012. Unfortunately, as the study indicates, this is most likely a minimum casualty figure. The true number of those killed is potentially much higher. The most documented killings were in rural Damascus with 17,800 people dead. Next were Homs with 16,400, Aleppo 11,900 and Idlib with 10,300 people killed. Describing the conflict as senseless, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights noted that children, too, have not been spared. The killings of close to 7,055 minors, including at least 1,729 children under 10 years old, have been documented. There are also well-documented cases of individual children being tortured and executed, and entire families, including babies, being massacred which, along with this devastatingly high death toll, is a terrible reminder of just how vicious this conflict has become. Meanwhile, the United States is debating what more it might do to help the Syrian opposition in its civil war against the government. We are deeply concerned about the dire situation in Syria, including the involvement of Hezbollah, as well as Iran, across state lines in another country. So we are focusing our efforts now on doing all that we can to support the opposition as they work to change the balance on the ground. The White House has debated for months whether to give arms to the rebels, but the issue is now firmly on the table given increased involvement by Hezbollah and Iran in backing Syrian President Bashar al-Assad in the battlefield. International envoy for Syria, Lakhdar Brahimi, will be meeting U.S. and Russian officials on 25th June to discuss plans for peace talks, which Brahimi has said he hopes to hold in Geneva in July. 
Time now to take a look at some of the other international news in a quick wrap. Here's Globe Watch. Greek Prime Minister Antonis Samara said he was determined to push through reforms but would not bow to special interests that made ERT corrupt and wanted to keep it open. He offered for ERT to operate temporarily in an interim phase until the new broadcaster would be formed. The abrupt closure of ERT without warning shocked the nation and sparked a barrage of criticism by opposition parties and even the parties in the coalition. Ailing Nelson Mandela spent a sixth night in the MediClinic Heart Hospital in Pretoria on Friday. The former South African president has been undergoing treatment for nearly a week for recurring lung infection. The presidency has described Mandela's condition as serious but stable. President Jacob Zuma, accompanied by African National Congress Treasurer General Zweli Mikize, visited him on Thursday. A deadly wildfire that has ravished 400 homes, ranking as Colorado's most destructive ever, subsided on Friday as authorities reported significant headway in containing the blaze on outskirts of Colorado Springs with help from rain and calmer winds. The fire has charred roughly 24 square miles of rolling forested terrain northeast of Colorado's second largest city since it erupted on June 11, killing two people and forcing some 38,000 to flee their homes. And now a look at all the sports news that you might have missed this week. A quick look at that in sports action. Hussein Bolt bounced back from a rare defeat, setting a track record at the Bislett Games on Thursday in his first 200-meter race of the season. Bolt, who lost the 100 by 0.01 seconds in Rome last week, finished in 19.79. He is the only one to break 20 seconds this season. Bolt topped the Bislett record set by Frank Fredericks of Namibia in 1996 by 0.03 seconds. Barcelona's Argentina forward Lionel Messi and his father denied wrongdoing after the Spanish tax authorities accused them of defrauding the state of more than 4 million euros. The World Player of the Year and his father, George, allegedly filed fraudulent tax returns for the year 2006 to 2009, according to Jose Miguel Company, a spokesman for the prosecutor's office for tax crimes in Catalonia. Eight-time French Open champion Rafael Nadal dropped from number 4 to number 5 in ATP rankings this week, swapping places with David Ferrer, the man he beat in Roland Garros final. Nadal only retained the ranking points he earned by winning last year's French Open, while Ferrer gained points by reaching his first Grand Slam final. Nadal celebrated his unprecedented eighth win at the French Open with a trip to Disneyland Paris. The player, often dubbed the King of Paris, was met with cheers and chants from eager crowds as he displayed his trophy in the shadow of the theme park's castle. English champion racehorse trainer Henry Cecil, who triumphed a record 75 times at Royal Ascot, died of cancer on June 11 at the age of 70. In his later years, the 10 times champion trainer looked after Frankel, the highest rated racehorse in the world, who was unbeaten in 14 starts before retirement last year with almost £3 million in earnings from 15 victories. He trained four Derby winners, Slip Anchor, Reference Point, Commander in Chief, and Oath, as well as six 1,000 Guineas and four St. Liga winners. Have a look at all the very latest news from the world of movies and lifestyle. Have a look at the entertainment wrap. Action star Jackie Chan got celebrated by the Film Society of Lincoln Center and New York Asian Film Festival for his 40 years of work in the cinema. The two-day gala began at the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office in New York, where the star was presented the Star Asia Lifetime Achievement Award. After the ceremony, Chan's latest film, Chinese Zodiac, was screened, followed by a special question and answer session with fans. After 75 years, Superman continues to soar with the latest installment of the superhero tale, Man of Steel. Actor Henry Cavill steps into the role of Clark Kent for the first time. Director Zack Snyder revamped the tale of a boy born on Krypton and raised on Earth with superpowers in an effort to make Superman more relatable. For Kevin Costner, who plays Superman's father on Earth, Jonathan Kent, the believability factor was something that stopped him from becoming a fan as a child. The trailer for the second installment of director Peter Jackson's The Hobbit trilogy based on classic tale by author J.R.R. Tolkien was released on June 11. The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smog, premieres this December about a year after The Hobbit, an unexpected journey hit cinema screens. Under the vaulted ceilings of Paris Grand Palais, just off the Champs-Élysées, film fans settle down to enjoy a drive-in with a difference. A thousand movie lovers a day are expected to visit the 100-year-old exhibition hall that has been temporarily converted to screen cult classics including Pulp Fiction and Dirty Dancing. Cinema Paradiso runs until June 21st. 
That's all we have for you in this edition of World Panorama. See you next week, same time, with more international news. Till then, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. As I sign off, here's the first look of upcoming film Diana. In the trailer, get a glimpse into actress Naomi Watts' portrayal of the late British royal Diana, Princess of Wales. You can catch the film only in September. Goodbye and thanks for tuning in. Thank you.